The modern rear derailleur is a pretty marvelous feat of mechanical engineering. It has the thankless job of moving the chain from one cog to the next and maintaining chain tension regardless of whatever gear combination you're in. And to pile on, manufacturers are continually pushing boundaries to get more gears onto the rear cassette and at the same time widen the overall range of gears in the drivetrain. In this video, a breakdown on two key specs of rear derailleurs that are often confused and hopefully some insight into how to be sure a particular derailleur will work for your application. So when you're shopping around for a new rear derailleur, you'll generally filter down by the number of gears it's designed to shift through. But if you scroll down, you'll also see a bunch of specs that define the derailleur's limitations. Things like maximum and minimum cog size for the largest and smallest sprockets, as well as terms like derailleur capacity. Now of these specifications, there are two really important ones that will ultimately dictate whether or not a particular derailleur will work on your setup. The first one is called derailleur capacity. So when you shift through the gears, of course you'll notice the rear derailleur moving, but you can break this motion down into two degrees of freedom. The first is the lateral movement, which generally follows the contour of the cassette. This is the motion that's actually moving the chain from cog to cog. But then you'll also notice that the derailleur cage itself moves fore and aft. And this motion is required because the chain has a fixed length, but each gear combination requires a different effective chain length. So the job of the derailleur cage is to take up that extra slack in the chain and preserve tension in the system so the chain doesn't flop around or get too tight. And this is where the derailleur capacity spec is defined. The length of the derailleur cage is finite and the angular displacement is also spatially limited, which places an upper limit on the total amount of slack that the cage can take up. Manufacturers quantify this upper limit by the derailleur capacity which is the difference in the number of teeth of the largest cog and the smallest cog on one by systems. For instance, a derailleur with a capacity of 40 teeth would be able to shift a one by system all the way through say a 10 to 50 tooth cassette or hypothetically a five to 45 tooth cassette or even a 20 to 60 tooth cassette if those existed. Now generally a longer derailleur cage will yield a larger derailleur capacity. Now the downside to longer cages are of course that they are physically bigger, which increases the chances of damage by rocks or other trail debris. And also some have reported that the shifting with longer derailleur cages is just not as crispy or precise as a short shorter, stiffer cage found on many performance road bikes. So anyways, what you want to look at is the difference in the number of teeth on your cassette. And if that number is bigger than the stated derailleur capacity, then your derailleur will technically not work for that application. Another thing to keep in mind is that the rear derailleur is the only point in the drivetrain system that has the ability to take up chain slack. This means that for two by and three by systems, the rear derailleur cage is actually pretty long because you also have to account for the difference in the front chain rings as well. For instance, on a two by system, the term drivetrain capacity is often used to describe the maximum delta in chain length for a given system. For example, a two by GRX system with 48 tooth and 31 tooth chain rings paired to an 11 to 34 tooth cassette would have a capacity defined by the difference in the number of teeth between the two chain rings added to the difference in the number of teeth between the largest and smallest cogs on the cassette. So again, we would need a derailleur with at least a 40 tooth derailleur capacity. Now, many rear derailleurs designed for two by systems actually have a pretty large capacity. So one might be inclined to ask if you can just run such a derailleur, like say a GRX 810, on a wide ranging one by mullet setup. However, there is a second spec that we also need to pay attention to. And that's the maximum cog spec, sometimes referred to as low sprocket max or the max sprocket spec. Now this specification has nothing to do with the cage length, but rather the clearance between the upper pulley wheel and the largest cog on the cassette. Now the B limit screw on a derailleur can adjust this distance to some degree, but ultimately some derailleurs are designed such that the upper pulley wheel just cannot clear a huge sprocket sprocket on the cassette. So the low sprocket max specification indicates the largest cog on the cassette that can be used without interference. For instance, the GRX 810 rear derailleur, which is designed for two by systems, again has a pretty large capacity at 42 teeth, but the low sprocket max is only 34 teeth, which would make it a poor choice for say a wide ranging one by setup, despite it having sufficient capacity. Now, some companies like Wolf Tooth, for instance, make derailleur hanger extenders like the Road Link and the Goat Link, which among other reasons serve to increase the derailleur's low sprocket max. Now these extenders physically move the derailleur further away from the cassette, allowing the upper pulley wheel to clear a larger 
larger cassette. And then there are other companies like Garbarook who manufacture and sell derailleur modifications like the extended cage and pulleys for GRX derailleurs. Now this setup is what I'm using on the Ritchie Outback and it allows the GRX 812 to run up to a 50 tooth big cog on the cassette. Now I'm not exactly sure the details but because it's longer and it uses different pulleys, presumably relocated, it actually increases both the derailleur capacity and the low sprocket max with a single modification. Now I've been running this setup for the better part of a year and it's been totally flawless. The shifting feels just like stock. And then there are the hacks, which in large part motivated this video. Because the past two videos we've put out focus on different ways to extend the capacity and the low sprocket max of existing 11 speed GRX 1x setups. Now in the first video we swapped a 12 speed GRX 822 derailleur limited to 11 speeds onto an existing GRX 11 speed setup. Now we did this because Frank wanted to try running an 11 to 51 tooth cassette on his gravel bike, but the stock GRX 812 derailleur only has a max low sprocket of 42 teeth, which in reality is actually a pretty conservative number. I've actually personally gotten away with running a 46 tooth sprocket using the GRX 812 in stock form, and I know others have claimed to be able to run up to a 50 tooth with no modifications. I just don't have any personal experience with that. But anyways, in this case, the GRX 822 12 speed derailleur has a max low sprocket of 51 teeth with a derailleur capacity of 41 teeth. And because the 11 and 12 speed Shimano systems have the same pull ratio, it was actually a direct swap. And then lastly, in our most recent video, rather than buy a new 12 speed GRX derailleur, we actually just modified a GRX 812 by swapping out the stock cage for one from an XT mountain bike derailleur. Now this modification didn't actually do anything to increase the max low sprocket, so I was a little bit skeptical, but it certainly increased the derailleur capacity just because it's physically longer. Nonetheless, now with a properly sized chain, you can actually see that it works really well. The B-limit screw is pretty much maxed out and I am happy to report that it does clear the 51 tooth cog on this Dior 11 to 51 tooth cassette but not by much. Oh and someone else asked about backpedaling. On some of these wide ranging one by mullet setup hacks if you backpedal the chain sometimes will fall off. I'm also happy to report that this drivetrain is actually pretty smooth in the lowest climbing gear. I can backpedal really fast with no indication that the chain will pop off. So kind of a nerdy and techy one this week. I hope it made some sense. Now I'm coming to the realization that anytime we put out a video that explains something or makes some type of claim, there will always be heaps of criticism in the comments about something we missed or explained incorrectly. Now the truth is I actually welcome all of that feedback and actually encourage it because at the end of the day we're all learning together. My only ask is that we just keep the comments positive and more importantly constructive. I know it's a big ask but you know let's at least try. Thanks again for watching and thanks for subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. I'll see you next time.